so thank you for uh, coming. Uh, always good to have an audience. Uh, and it's nice to see everybody after one, two, three years, three, three years <laughs> since, since we were last here. Uh, it's good to get all that uh, COVID past us and, uh, and be back to normal. Um, today, I'm mostly going to be talking about RiskOS developments, but I will also cover a little bit of our comp news around the edges because I have to eat. <laughs> um, so, uh, what, once I start on the talk, we'll have some Dutch translation, so I'll talk in English and then um, we will. Good uh, welcome. And you have all have over risk risk developments, a little bit about our conference in the department, in the E. And I'll tell you about it. And that's what I've done. Kun je naast en de gestand zijn? Alstublieft. Uiteraard. Moet ook in gebarentaal? Ja, nee, de handen. Nee, nee, ik ga niet in gebarentaal doen. Die taal die spreek ik niet. Dus uh, als iemand doof is, en we hebben iemand, die is er niet bij, uh, dan uh, hebben we daar een andere tolk voor nodig. Dus nee, hier houden we het bij. Uh. Ik hoop je ook niet te spreken. Want papa was al bezig met uh, real-time ondertiteling. Ja. Dus, dus dat gaat helemaal goed komen. Is het trouwens noodzakelijk? Heeft iemand behoefte aan vertaling? There's somebody who needs a translation. Nou. Ja, dat is ook niet Good point. Nee, even serieus. Ja, yeah, uh, inderdaad serieus, want dat is good point. Could be smoother if there is no translation. Yeah, if, if, yeah. If, if everybody is fine in English. N niemand vindt het nodig? Dan ga ik even zitten. Oké. Yeah. Okay, well, your your English will be much better than my Dutch. <laughs> okay, so, um, so I'm going to be doing my demonstration on one of our new Forte 2 computers. So that's why it says Forte 2 on the background. Um, the big news from RiskOS developments in the last couple of weeks has been the release of our new TCP IP stack uh, for all users of modern RiskOS 5 computers. The new TCP IP stack has been a major project for us um, and has actually been made possible because of a commercial com company based in the Nether Netherlands. And it enables us to uh, modernize the networking on RiskOS. Um, built on the framework of uh, the very secure OpenBSD operating system. And that paves the way for Wi-Fi and other developments in the coming months. The first thing we wanted to do was deliver a very solid and reliable base product. So we've concentrated on delivering IPv4 and the modern IPv6 protocols um, on as many network interfaces as we can with uh, an emphasis on compatibility with existing software. So we've tried to ensure that every single application that currently runs on a RISC-OS 5 computer will run correctly with the new TCP IP stack. That includes programs written for both Acorn's old Internet 4 module and the Internet 5 module. Um, and programmers do not need to modify any of their code to use the new TCP IP stack. There are, of course, new commands available if, if people want to take advantage of new features. If you want to make your program work with IPv6, for example, uh, there are commands to, to do that. And where practical, we are making the avail items available for the older systems as well, so that if you want to issue commands to work on both IPv4 and IPv6, the, the commands that are required to do so will work on the older machines running only IPv4, so that you don't, you don't restrict your customers or restrict your users to um, having to have the new TCP IP stack. So we've tried to emphasize compatibility both with the old 
and with the new in the new TCP IP stack. You can see uh, in the late, latest build in INET configure, you can just simply tick IPv6 to enable IPv6 on your computer. Um, so it's all present and correct. Um, the technology for Wi-Fi is actually already present in the stack. Um, so the 802.11 uh, Wi-Fi protocols are already present in the stack as it ships. The only thing missing for the Wi-Fi are two things. Driver for the actual hardware and um, user interface for selecting the Wi-Fi network. So those are our next priority for the development of the TCP IP. Um, earlier in the year, uh, we uh, had some development work done uh, in conjunction with RISCOS Open um, to develop the, uh, the uh, what, is, what is called SDIO. And this is on, on our modern ARM boards. Most of the Wi-Fi chips and other connections go through SDIO. Uh, it's a connection bus um, normally used for SD cards, uh, but the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth controllers are also on SDIO. And the work that we commissioned and, and released in January, February uh, unlocks SDIO so that the Raspberry Pi, the IMX6, the ARM book, the uh, well, all the modern, I think Panda board, Beagle board, all the modern boards will, um, they can now see all the devices on the SDIO bus. And that means, uh, and, and we also created programmer layers uh, for uh, porting Linux and OpenBSD code. So that with the programming layers and the SDIO, Drivers can be easily ported to Risk OS um, from any open source Linux or OpenBSD system. So that means that with that section of code completed and the new TCP IP stack, all we need to do is create the driver for the Pi or the Panda board or the IMX6 to slot in between the SDIO driver TCP IP stack. So we're making progress. <laughs> um, and the point, important thing is that we've been able to release this now um, and people are using it. You can download it for free from the RiskOS Developments website and install it on any RiskOS 5 modern computer uh, and use it. Uh, we are also working, just before I left on Thursday, um, there was a new component through that should also allow us to run with all old uh, network cards and machines going back to potentially risk PC as well. So um, soon, soon we will have even, even more machines able to, to take advantage of it. Um, so that is the TCP IP. Uh, we would encourage you to download it. In certain situations, it can be significantly faster. Normally it is about the same sort of speed, give or take, as the current TCP IP stack, but some systems, the titanium board for example, goes much faster. I think that's up to 40 times faster on a gigabit connection than it was previously with the old TCP IP stack, so that is quite a big difference. On a Pi 4, uh, it can also be noticeably faster uh, because of the extra speed of the processor. Um, we started working on this because a customer in the Netherlands required it, but also because it was essential to the development of the Iris web browser that we had a modern TCP IP network stack. Our overall goal with all this work is to deliver a, a version of RISC OS uh, that can compete with Raspberry Pi OS as a ready to go operating system that people can just download and use for free um, and have an experience that is good 
and as good as they would get with Raspberry Pi OS on a Raspberry Pi hardware, or any other board that we support um, as well. Um, in the UK, we feel that RISC OS ought to have been more popular with Raspberry Pi, but it did not get the support from the Pi Foundation that we hoped it would. And if we can deliver something that is feature has the same features and is, is good but is a, but fast and risk us we think then we will have a good product that we can uh, offer to Pi users as a complete desktop operating system so obviously a key part of that will be the iris web browser and that's what I will show you now um, so I will start it from from scratch see it doing fast uh, uh, dynamic JavaScript elements quickly. Um, if we go to, um, I don't know, I'm just trying to think what is a good, good example site. If we pick something like Amazon, which is traditionally a difficult website, you can see that that's coming up quite acceptably. Um, Okay. It's doing better than this when I was on the stand earlier. Right. What's going on now? So you can see that the Iris web browser is delivering the web content uh, as you would expect it to look, uh, with the JavaScript functioning as you would expect it to function. Um, the latest work has been done on the uh, address uh, sorry, on, on the on the hot lists. Um, I thought I'd saved. I thought I'd saved the Big Ben Club into the hot list earlier. Okay, so um, basically. This month's work has been adding folders um, and drag and drop to the Hotlist Manager. Um, and so now we can create folders and drag things in and out of folders in the address book, uh, in, the, in the hotlist manager. Um, we're hoping to see the full formal uh, release, uh, free release of Iris before the end of this year. Uh, but in the meantime, you can support RISCOS Development's work uh, by buying a copy of the O Browser CD, which includes Iris as part of the purchase, and we have those on the stand uh, to buy. Uh, I believe it's about 45 euros, I think, uh, although I don't have the price list to hand. Um, and that helps fund the development work that we're doing on Iris. Uh, the main missing feature now uh, is um, is video. Um, we will probably not have video in the version one. It's more important that we finish the rest of the uh, sort of user interface work uh, before we uh, before the version one. And then once we've got the version one out, then the next priority will be video. 
um, within the uh, within the browser, so you can do YouTube and the like. But uh, uh, get the first first version out first, uh, get it available for everybody, and then we can uh, get the video side of things working. Uh, I'm pretty certain that it should all be possible to get that working relatively straightforwardly. <coughs> Although you will need a fairly meaty computer for uh, for video on Risk OS, uh, I would recommend a Pi 4 or a Titanium class system for video um, on on Risk OS machines. That's just not, sorry. Not <sighs> for small small videos, not not the big videos. Um, that simply the, the the processing power required because. Risk OS doesn't do hardware acceleration of video. It's having to software decode the video, and if you're running at high resolution video, it will be very, very stuttery um, on, uh, unless you have the faster computers. Um, on the Armex 6, I don't want to say it will not be possible, but I would have thought probably only at standard definition based on my previous ex experience. Um, maybe 720p, but think think DVD quality rather than high definition quality um, would be my thinking. Um, I will show some video in a moment when I'm talking about our uh, programmer's uh, reference manual documentation project, um, so that you can see video wor working on Risk OS. But as I say, probably going to be restricted to the faster machines for the higher resolution video. Um, Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, are you also experiencing licensing issues uh, during the development of this browser because of uh, the, the playing of video and other types of media or content? Pretty much all of the important stuff that we need is open source, yeah. so uh, we haven't thus far requ had required any licensing facilities. Uh, it would likely be plugging into a pre-existing piece of software like mPlayer or, or GStreamer uh, for the for video playback. So it would be a case of porting some existing software rather than requiring to develop something afresh. Um, to be honest with you, we haven't looked into that side of things too greatly um, because we've been concentrating on the core core browser. Um, our feeling would probably be to, to not support codecs that required uh, required licensing. Uh, I believe that most of the sort of most of the open platforms use formats that are free of licensing at the moment. But as I say, I haven't dug into that, so you are asking a question that I don't know too much about. I do know that traditionally MPEG and uh, or particularly M MPEG has suffered from licensing restrictions. Um, but I believe a lot of that has come out in the wash to a degree, so that uh, there are quite a few open source implementations that don't require uh, the licensing. And because it will be a free product and an open source product. You're probably referring to the white vine level 23. For instance, yeah, that's, that's white vine. But uh, any other issues with. Uh, Yeah, I mean, basically, because we've we've started with an open source project and we're going to deliver an open source project, mm -hmm. then most of the licensing has to be yeah open yeah, yeah. Uh, we're not a closed source project, and whilst we are asking for donations, we are not charging for the web browser. I want to make that clear. I know it seems like we are, but it's an, it will ultimately be a free product, and what you're contributing towards if you buy the uh, product is making a contribution to our operating costs of paying programmers to do the actual work in the development. Um, we are not selling the browser and if you wait, hopefully by the end of this year, you will be able to get the browser for free with its source code. Um, just like the TCP IP stack, you can download the TCP IP stack, you can ask for the source code, it's available free of charge and we'll email you the source code um, straight away. Uh, so. Um, Obviously, when we get to video, which will probably be next year, then we will be looking into any, you know, if, if that's going to be a problem, 
we'll let you know. But at the moment, for JavaScript and things like that, because it's based on um, the WebKit engine, uh, which is app open source from Apple, uh, primarily, um, and um, and the JavaScript engine that comes with uh, with WebKit GTK, um, then uh, you know it, it's it's all just available. You just download it and compile it and re and release it as part of that. Uh, you know, obviously, all the, the folder inside called licenses with all of the license documentation for the various different bits that we have to reproduce in there. So, okay. Um, so, yes, um, Iris is integrated into the RISCOS desktop, so we can, for example, highlight text, press Control C, and simply paste it into edit. Um, we can also highlight a piece of text here. Oops, let's take that, Control C, and paste that into the browser. So although it's powered by the WebKit engine, in terms of actually usability within RISCOS, it works very much like a native RISCOS application in terms of its integration with the RISCOS desktop and the protocols. Um, you can double click on files. Uh, I'm trying to think of a good, good example file here. Uh, I'm looking for an HTML file. Uh, let's have a little look. I believe Fireworks has HTML documentation. Ah, oh, there's a license file there. You can see that we can just double click on a RISCOS file and it simply loads it just like you would expect with NetSurf or what have you. Um, you can also make text selections um, and save out. Uh, text into other programs like Impression or Ovation, um, all the things that you would expect. I mean, I, I'm, um, we can also save our images and also a link to a page. Um, basically, it's what you would expect from a RISC-OS browser, uh, but it is all present and correct now. Um, In terms of compatibility, it seems to handle pretty much every site that we throw at it. Um, it should work with all the banks and things, um, but with the caveat that we don't do the video, so that rules out the YouTube side of things. Um, so, um, we have the O Browser Iris CDs at the show. Um, we also have, uh, as a low-cost item, if you wish, if you don't want to buy a full Iris but you would like to support what we're doing, we also have a few of the Risk OS Direct uh, SD cards for Raspberry Pi systems uh, available to purchase on the stand. I think they're about 15 euros, if I remember rightly, um, as a low-cost item, uh, and that includes the SD card. Risk OS Direct. Uh, is our outreach project uh, to get new users to uh, take on board Risk OS. Um, it was sadly curtailed by the COVID outbreak. The original plan was to, we had pr purchased a whole load of SD cards that we were going to give out to new users at shows and events, um, sort of pie jams. And we were go the plan was to, to send some over to you guys in, in Holland to give out to. Uh, uh, you know, at, at any sort of pie jams and other pie events, to encourage new users to uh, to try out Risk OS. We think that if we can give them an SD card, um, put it in their hands, and tell them about Risk OS, and say, "Here, take a free copy of Risk OS on an SD card," then they might actually try Risk OS, and we might get some new users in. And the idea is that, but the Risk OS Direct distribution has a much more comprehensive software selection. Uh, compared to just downloading Risk OS um, from the Risk uh, from our partners at Risk OS Open, uh, where you just get the core operating system. With Risk OS Direct, we can offer a you know a range of applications ready to go. Um, you put it in your Pi, it will automatically configure the network um, and give you a more comprehensive Risk OS experience. And then, if I say if we can deliver that free of charge to people um, who are new to the platform. Um, then um, 
this is how we hope to reach out to get new people to come in and try RiskOS. Um, you can download RiskOS Direct for free, of course, as well. And there are videos on YouTube telling you how to install it and set it up. Um, again, we wanted to reach out to people uh, and use YouTube as a method of uh, showing people how to use RiskOS and how to install it, and, you know, how to download, install it if they want to do it that way. Uh, but basically, to reach out to people um, to try and increase the user base for RiskOS because it's all well and good as doing all of this development, uh, and obviously we're keen to support the existing user base, but we need to be growing RiskOS and encouraging more people to use it. And that's what RiskOS Direct is all about. Um, so our next project is Pinboard 2, which is, again, free of charge. You can have a copy just by asking for it. Just send an email to me, and I will send you a free copy of Pinboard 2. It is still in beta. Again, we're hoping to release this this year. Uh, but so many things to release and so little time. <laughs> um, so Pinboard 2 um, is a revamp of the RiskOS desktop experience. Uh, we can now uh, save to the desktop as you would on other platforms. So just save. You can see that the text file there is um, shown without the pin icon. Um, the pin board in RiskOS was always quite unique because it was the only part of RiskOS that actually did shortcuts or, or links. Normally in RiskOS, if you have a file in any folder, it exists in that folder and only in that folder unless you copy it to another folder, in which case you have two copies of it. Pinboard was quite unique in that it was the only place where you could put something and it was effectively a link a shortcut to that file rather than being the actual file. So it was important to distinguish that with the pins once we started allowing people to actually save work onto the pin board because you need to know which files are files on the pin board and which things are links to things on your hard drive or solid state disk. Um, so um, in Pinboard 2, uh, as well as acting as a full filing system, uh, you can see that if we press menu over that, we have a full set of filer type operations that we can do on it. Um, we can create new directories, and we can also see the parent directory where all this is stored, and you can choose where to put the Pinboard files. So by default it saves it into Boot Choices Pinboard Saved Files. And because that is, um, because, because when you save it to the pin board, it is saving it to there. If you back up that folder in the normal way with RiskOS, you'll also be backing up your pin board files. And it's totally dynamic. So if we were to put something <coughs> into, uh, into that folder, it will appear straight on the pin board. So if I put this MP4 file into here, you can see that it has appeared. There we are. You can see that that's appeared on the pin board automatically. If I delete it from the pin board folder, it vanishes from the desktop as well. So it keeps track of what's going on. Similarly, if you move uh, a pinned item around, it will keep. It will notice that you've moved a pinned item, so that it can still find it. And if you move the files around, you don't lose them off the pin board, uh, and it's smart enough to do that. It can save the contents of, the, save the, your pins when you shut down and restart, but it does, that is an optional feature, so it can behave like the current RiskOS pin board, or it can behave more like uh, a Windows desktop in terms of how the pin board works. We also have what we call sticky notes, so we can go new sticky. Um, and you can see it's got a star to indicate that we've edited it and made a change. We can give it a title. And 
and when we hover over it, we can see the title with the star. And you can have as many stickies as you want, and you can use those on the pin board, and they will be saved in the normal manner. And when we decide we've had enough of our sticky, we simply deleted and it's gone. And that's a standard part of the new pin board. Um, and we've also done a lot of the sort of obvious things like expanding the number of formats that you can use for the pin board backdrop. So you can now use JPEGs, PNG, pretty much any any common graphic format can be used as a pin board. Um, you'll see we have a cache option for non-sprite files. Um, what that does is quietly converts the uh, foreign graphic format into a sprite before use. Um, so for example, if you drop a JPEG into it, you could use it natively, but if you've tried to use a large, you know, you take, use your camera to make a picture and then use it as a, a desktop pin board background as a JPEG, you'll know that the desktop redraw can be quite jerky and glacial. Um, if you tick the cache option, it will quietly convert that JPEG into a sprite in the background and then use that sprite to be your pinball backdrop so that you get a much smoother experience on the desktop when using JPEGs and other graphic formats. Um, and that once you've ticked that option, it's transparent, so you can then just go and use the JPEGs and the PNGs or whatever you want to do, and Risk OS will take care of giving you the smoothest possible experience when using those files. Uh, we also have a new scaling option, which is full screen. Traditionally, Risk OS would try and put the, uh, the, the, the backdrop from here to here, which is fine if you know that that's what it's going to do. But a lot of backdrops come at fixed sizes. Well, all of them tend to come as fixed sizes, and they tend to come in sizes that are designed for PCs. So that tends to mean in 1080p or in 4K, which means it's measured from here to here because Windows puts the backdrop all the way down to the bottom of the screen behind its equivalent of the icon bar, the, the taskbar. If you use the full screen option, Risk OS will do the same thing. That means that the, your 1080p wallpaper will then fill 1080p of the screen, so you won't have it squashed uh, vertically, which you would otherwise have, you'd otherwise have to tick the scale option, or you would find it disappearing off the top of the screen. Uh, and if you scaled it, it would look a bit weird with the scaling. So if you pick the full screen option, it will fill the whole of the screen behind the icon bar, allowing you to make use of full 1080p backdrops without having to modify them to trim them down to size. Uh, you can control many aspects of it. I won't go through every single option, but suffice to say that there is a lot of stuff in here. Uh, one little option which I'll just momentarily show is the watermark feature which lets you use draw files as part of the pin board as well. So as well as the sort of bitmap background, you can, all Im you can include a logo or other element onto the desktop uh, in a variety of locations that's in a draw file format. And then that will be overlaid on top of whatever pin board that you might have. So for example, uh, one guy showed us using a he'd, he'd create he'd, he'd use it risk, risk OSM to make a map of his hometown and then he's overlaid this map of his hometown onto uh, a fairly plain backdrop so he could have a map of his hometown in vector format overlaid onto his desktop. I'm using it here to put a Forte 2 logo in and because it's a draw file I can change the scale on that so I can set that. Not 2000. <laughs> And you can see now the Forte 2 logo is larger. Um, Andrew? Yeah? I suggest you now move to the arm part of the talk. Okay. Which is already half an hour in. The talk is supposed to be about half an hour, so I think it's good to have oh, the yeah. arm. I do talk too, I talk too much, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I will just finish with one small uh, piece then uh, for Risk Cost Developments on our documentation project, which is. Uh, we're working with um, a number of people, uh, but one, one person that you may remember from history uh, is, uh, um, goes by the name of Jerf, uh, and formerly Justin Fletcher of RiskOS Limited, um, has come back into the RiskOS fold and is helping us with the documentation for RiskOS. 
uh, and he made this video of um, his project uh, this may be the wrong video hold on a minute that's the 1080p version. We'll go with the smaller version for the sake of this TV. That's better. What this is showing is uh, the PDF, uh, so Programmer's Reference Manuals in XML project, which it basically involves uh, the, the Programmer's Reference Manuals have been converted into XML, from which we can generate PDF, HTML, text, whatever format people want the programmer's documentation in can be generated from one code base and that code base can be stored in the git alongside whatever module it applies to so a programmer who's working on say the wimp can make changes to the wimp documentation at the same time and then out will pop the programmer's documentation for the wimp in any of the desired formats and what this is showing is how it can be styled to look exactly like the acorn documentation and this is all been converted already um, so we're probably about two-thirds of the way through uh, the program as reference manuals now and also updating the content as as it goes um, so you can see that being demonstrated there um, as an mp4 video um, running quite happily on this guys um, and if I load in an example let me just make sure it's the right one it's a slightly newer one there. Yep. So this is the PR, the actual PRM being viewed in Risco S, and you can see I can just click on a thing and it takes me to the page. Um, it's fast and smooth, and there's a lot of it. Three thousand six hundred and twenty-six pages at the moment. <laughs> Um, as I say, that can be presented as uh, as you see it there, or um, or being well, I should be able to bring this up in Iris in HTML. Uh, and there you can see the same index. I don't know how well this works from the zip, so um, if it, oh, that seems to be working. Um, and you can see that all comes up appropriately in HTML or in PDF and that's all generated from the same source uh, and again that will be available free of charge to everybody um, going through uh, Jeff has been extremely helpful in making sure that not only are things available from both the Ritzkos Limited era and the Castle era, but also to make sure that things are kept parallel and properly documented about what happened in the past as well as what's happening now. Um, and it's really great to be able to sort of bridge that gap that was once such a problem uh, to be able to all work together again now is a huge, huge thing uh, that we're really pleased about. Um, uh, Side. Sorry? Well, this, was a, this was open side. Yep. But also web pages with all kinds of uh, the, the, uh, yeah. the that was that stemmed from the uh, strong help files. And the people who are doing this project are actually the same people who did that work originally. Essentially it was done and then it was left to rot. Um, so uh, rather than um, what, the intention is basically that we will be able to update that with the work that's being done here, but rather than do it in several different places, you know, do, doing a little bit in several different places, the purpose of the XML project is that it's done once centrally in the XML, and then it can generate HTML, which can be on the rule site. Um, you can have the PDF version, you can have text version, you can load it into Impression or Tech Writer, you know. Uh, because sometimes you see on the roll side, roll side that there are some edits still being made on yeah. those pages. Yeah. Are they just being fed back? In yes, they are. Okay. Uh, because the guy who looks after that section on the RISCOS Open website is a guy called Alan Robertson. And he's involved, alongside Jeff, 
in this project. In fact, Alan's doing a lot of the actual sort of day-to-day -day work um, on the conversion of the thing. So, uh, that's the goal. Yeah, yeah. Um, that that that's our that's our intent. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so that's probably enough about risk ice developments. Uh, but by all means, come to the stand and have a lot. Ask me anything you like about what we're doing. Um, it keeps me very busy. Uh, I don't get paid for the risk cost development work per se, um, but um, I think it's very important because without that work, I think the risk OS market would not be in such good shape, and that would affect my ability to operate as our comp. And so that's why I feel that I need to do both things, uh, because if I just did it as our comp, I would have to make money off it. And so much of the risk cost development's work has to be done for free because it needs to be freely available to the whole platform. So on the R comp front, our big new release is the, um, the Forte 2 computer, uh, which uh, marries together the power and speed of a, four, a Pi, Pi 4 board uh, with um, solid state disk, um, multiple HDMIs, full-size HDMI ports, front access power controls, SD card reader, and so on, uh, front USBs, just like a, all, you know, essentially all the features that you would get on something like an RMX6. <coughs> um, and it comes with a wide range of software, including our Forte tools, uh, which has just been expanded to support overclocking um, and fan control facilities. Uh, we have graphics modes um, for compatibility with old software as well as new software. You control keyboard options. Um, there's the lock screen, the automated networking that I talked very briefly about earlier. Uh, so you can just plug in a network cable. Uh, you can automatically share your drives, automatically set up VNC so you can remotely operate the machine from <coughs> another computer. It supports a headless mode, so you don't need to use a monitor on your Pi. You can just connect your Forte to your network, and then just sit at your Mac or your PC and operate <coughs> your RISCOS machine in a window. That's really helpful for Zoom, where you can just um, you can share via VNC your RISCOS machine, and then do a Zoom presentation just pulling it in via VNC and operating that on a PC or a Mac uh, with Zoom. I'm using my crib sheet because otherwise I forget things. Um, the Forte tool software uh, is also available uh, is also available as a standalone product that if you don't want to buy a Forte, um, but kind of like the idea of having some some software that uh, and all I mean, you get basically not just the Forte tools, but you also get the things like the monitor definition files and all the comf all, basically everything apart from the commercial software that we do with a Forte, you can buy something called Pi Tools, which is a standalone version of Forte Tools, but for all Raspberry Pi users, so that works on everything, for, I believe, from a Pi Zero up to a Pi 400 uh, as a separate purchase. Um, then um, we have also recently released a new version of uh, Fireworks. I think that was the back end of last year. The new fireworks was again based on an, some ideas that we took from the last Dutch show. Uh, one of the uh, one of the club members requested the ability to save fireworks fire sheets into Impression, so that you could work on in, or Impression or Ovation Pro, so you could drop a spreadsheet straight in and edit it live. Uh, that's now possible in the latest fireworks. Uh, I won't I won't go too much into it because I know that there's. We're, we're pressed for time, but suffice to say, there's sort of pictures on the back of the thing, and I can demonstrate that to anybody who is interested in it. Uh, we've also had a new version of Messenger Pro uh, with uh, and, and NetFetch in recent times with modern SSL uh, facilities uh, and better handling of SMTP servers, uh, basically coping with the modern internet better. Um, and also on the back of this sheet, it's reminding me about our um, our high-end machines as well. We do, obviously, the things like the Forte are affordable machines at, at 250 pounds, 300 euros. 
uh, but we also do more elaborate and expensive machines. Um, uh, and, and our most our most elaborate machine is what we call the TIX Duet, TIX Duet, um, which combines both um, a RISC OS board and a Intel board. This is the last thing, yeah. <laughs> uh, but it has both a, a RISC OS board and an Intel board in the same machine. Then they talk to each other and can share resources between the two sides of the computer. Um, I was even able to uh, to use, uh, you know, although it's an Intel board, you can run a variety of operating systems on that. So if you know you could run Windows and Linux, obviously, but there are, should we say, more fruity flavored operating systems as well available for uh, Intel uh, boards. So you know you've got a variety of options uh, on how you want your uh, your machine configured alongside your Risk OS board. Um, uh, I mean, we call it call it a duet, but that implies two people, two two faces, uh, for one system. I think we did three, if not four, different operating systems on the system uh, for for the customer to to run and switch between on the fly. So, um, yeah, fun times. Um, so, yeah. Any questions? I would like to say this year, um, I I don't want to pin myself down because I don't want to disappoint anybody. In in theory, as I say, the technology building blocks are there. It is just a case of porting the actual driver that connects it together. So in principle, not not so difficult now. In practice. Until somebody actually sits and does that, does that work, we don't know how difficult it will prove to be. Um, I think the first step, actually, uh, as from what from having spoken to the program about it, the first step will actually not be like a, a Raspberry Pi driver or something like that. It will actually be a USB connected Wi-Fi adapter, because um, some of those are supported in OpenBSD, just as as pre-created drivers in the source tree. So if we port those pre-created drivers, it should be a fairly clean, just bring them over and recomp off they go. And I know that the programmer happens to have one of the USB chipsets that uh, is supported by that. So it wouldn't surprise me if that was done as a proof of concept. Um, one of the things we've already done but not released yet because it's not quite tidy and complete is we've looked at porting some more network drivers for different things from the OpenBSD world. So, for example, uh, at the moment on RISC OS USB Ethernet controllers, only a certain hand selection of USB Ethernet controller types are supported. Uh, primarily, um, oh, uh, sort of AX8877 something or other chips are the most commonly available ones that are supported. Most of the cheap USB Ethernet adapters use v, uh, VIA Realtek. Oh, do I mean VIA? Do I mean Realtek? I think I mean Realtek. Uh, Realtek chips. Um, and there isn't a driver for that for RISC OS, but there is for OpenBSD. So, in order to prove the concept of what is required to go from a BSD driver to a RISC OS driver, uh, one of the programmers has actually already ported that as a proof of proof of concept. Um, but obviously, it needs to be. Sort of properly integrated into the existing USB Ethernet driver to to really be particularly useful. But the point is that we've looked at how to bring things across, and once we've brought them across once, then we can repeat that process for the Wi-Fi drivers and other things. So, yeah. So thank you. Um, it was great to be here, and uh, hopefully uh, you can see that RiscOS is making some sort of progress. <laughs> <laughs>